Uh, I'm uh, working for Samsung as, a internet, as an ambassador for the Samsung Internet Project. Um, and uh, you may have also heard my name because I am co-chair of something in the W3C called the Technical Architecture Group, um, or the TAG. Um, it's a group that Alex Russell also sits on, and it's kind of a steering committee for web standardization, particularly around W3C stuff. Um, I've also been working on the web since before there was a web. Uh, so, uh, like Alex, I also remember when you had to yell, don't pick up the phone. Um, and, uh, and I've also been working uh, to uh, bring the web to mobile for quite some time. So, and I'm going to talk about some of the work that I did originally on some, something called the Mobile Web Initiative, which is from a kind of earlier uh, era of the, of the mobile web. Um, but I think it's important to realize that like, mobile devices have been around on the web for a while, and, and we're really uh, now coming into a new phase, I think. Um, Jung Ki here, who's going to talk uh, for most of the presentation, um, is a core member of the Samsung en Internet Engineering team. And he, he is also co-editor uh, of the service worker specification. So he's been working um, within the progressive web app sphere for quite a while as well. Um, so anyway, if you've been paying attention, uh, to yesterday's presentations, you may have uh, noticed something. When, uh, when people listed out browsers, uh, along with other great browsers out there, there was also something else, something that you might not have recognized, right? OK, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so right, so uh, yeah, I knew about these other things, but <laughs> really? I knew about these other things, but what about, what is this? What is Samsung Internet? What's this doing here? What's this new logo that I don't recognize, right? Um, so uh, we're going to um, answer those questions today. And, I, and um, so I want to tell you about, we're going to tell you a little bit about what Samsung Internet is and why it's there and, you know, how, uh, and the work that we're doing on it and why we're pretty excited about it. Although, since I am applying for UK citizenship right now, I am legally prohibited from using the word awesome. So I can't, uh, I can't say that about it. But it is really great. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about progressive web apps and, uh, in particular, uh, Service Worker. Um, we're, then I'm going to have a brief break for some philosophy. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to talk about something else uh, at the very end that's, that's quite interesting to us and is particu of particular interest to Samsung, which is web and VR, and some work that we're doing to bring web and VR together. Um, that you might not have heard of. And throughout this, we're going to be uh, re-emphasizing something here, which is our commitment to standards, and in, in particular, our commitment to implementation uh, of, um, of web standards and, and our work that, we're, that we've been doing in order to promote web standards and to develop those web standards and, and to really uh, make sure that we have a web that's based on standards. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Samsung Internet. What is Samsung Internet? So our articulation of it is that it's, a, it's the latest web tech in an easy-to-use package, right? So it's the default browser on um, Samsung phones, on, uh, in particular, Samsung Galaxy smartphones and tablets. Um, it's based on a Chromium uh, project, open source, obviously. Um, but what you might not be aware of is that Samsung is also a major contributor in, and, and committer into Chromium. Um, so we're actually, uh, c we've actually got a lot of engineers based in Seoul, based in Boston, um, that are uh, not only working with the Chromium project, but also working very much as a part of the Chromium project. And as a separate uh, project that we have, which is a uh, Gear VR browser, um, this is our VR-specific browser. It's based on the same core, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So why should you care about Samsung browser? Why should you care about any of this? Um, I wanted to display a, a graph which I, which I think articulates why you should care. So in Europe, uh, according to stat counter data, um, Samsung Internet is actually the number three browser, um, only behind, uh, well, Chrome and Safari. Uh, this is for all mobile browsing. Um, so this is actually a pretty significant number, and the number in uh, North America is pretty similar. Um, so, what, yeah, when, once StatCounter actually started 
breaking out Samsung Internet from the relevant Chrome version, it became quite clear that we actually had a pretty sizable market share. Um, in fact, beating out uh, the um, uh, previous uh, kind of Android browser, which includes, um, uh, you know, which, which is, the, is, is the kind of legacy um, device browser. Um, and, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is, this, so, why, so why is that? Why is that? Because when people get their new, smart, uh, their new smartphone, when regular people kind of get their new Samsung phone, um, they turn it on, and they see a button that says Internet, and they're like, uh, I want to use the Internet. OK, they, they uh, hit that, and they start using the web. And we want to make sure that that experience is as up-to-date and as, uh, um, as good as it can be. They can get the best possible web experience, including support for progressive web apps. And we want to make sure that that's in place. Um, so some other features of Samsung Internet that kind of differentiate it. Uh, First of all, we've got password keeping, which integrates with the fingerprint sensor. So that's kind of in line with um, integrating into the device, into integrating into the device capabilities. We're, we've got a focus right now on protecting users' privacy uh, or privacy. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, partly why we've implemented a secret mode, which is like uh, the uh, in incognito mode or privacy mode, but also we have a content blocking extension API in Samsung Internet, which is uh, quite innovative, I think. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, there's an enhanced multimedia uh, experience and uh, mobile to VR continuous experience. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And we've also got cu custom tab support. And if you want to read more uh, developer resources about uh, Samsung Internet and what differentiates it, this is the URL to go to. So. Um, so importantly, Samsung Internet also uh, supports not only the latest and greatest Samsung devices, but it's also backported to a whole bunch of previous generation devices. Um, that's something new for Samsung. Um, another th thing that is new is that updates are not linked to firmware releases, right? So now we have automatic updates that are rolling out um, through the Google Play Store, um, and that's uh, that is best practice, and that's something that we uh, that kind of uh, changed with the release of 4.0 browser earlier this year, um, which also included progressive web app support and um, push notifications. Right, so I just want to cover content blocking API. Uh, this is a, a third party uh, content, this is a third party API that basically allows third parties to build uh, content blockers. So we have Adblock Fast and Crystal, which are already uh, in the Play Store, and you can download those and install them separately. Um, we developed this because there's a strong user demand for content blocking uh, applications like this. And it's quite controversial. Um, but I, I, again, I think part of the reasoning here is to help users to uh, protect their privacy and help them uh, protect their personal data. Uh, because really, when, when you're talking about content blockers, um, you're talking about tracking blockers, mostly, uh, these days. Um, so Samsung's approach to this is to build uh, an API, uh, and, but to allow the third-party uh, developer community to build these uh, um, uh, blockers. Um, and finally, before I hand over to my colleague, um, I want to mention that we are actually building a developer uh, relations team based in London, uh, which I'm going to be uh, working with. And um, what we hope to be doing there is to support developers, to support developers in Europe and, and other places um, to be, uh, you're going to see a lot of us speaking at conferences. You're going to see more people from Samsung Internet kind of talking about progressive web apps, talking about push notifications, talking about web and VR, talking about all of these uh, capabilities. Um, and you're going to hopefully see us in more places around um, open source projects, contributing to open source projects, et cetera, stuff like that. OK, so with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jung Ki, who's going to talk with some more detail about uh, Service Worker. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jung Ki Song on Samsung Internet team. I'm working on uh, the web platforms and standards. So uh, we have talked a lot about service workers yesterday, so it's time to wrap up. So basically, service workers uh, solve two essential problems. 
Uh, first of all, service worker solves this live by. Service, service worker brings the reliability bits to uh, web application and the development. And the second, service worker solves this one. Like back in the days when we didn't have service workers, we actually did that uh, with push API. So uh, the push API try to define uh, this push event handler in uh, a page, like navigator that set message handler will set uh, this push event handler, and then uh, the event is kind of dispatched to this page. But uh, when the page is closed, then the whole context is gone. So it, was really, it wasn't possible, actually. And here's another example. Uh, the spec itself has been deprecated, but uh, the LM API in so, uh, system app applications working group, they try the same thing with that. Like, uh, they define this own alarm handler in page context. So uh, the service worker just brings the background service context to uh, web applications. So uh, Samsung has uh, contributed to service worker spec uh, since around like November 2013. So it has been around uh, more than two years. So uh, we just worked hard, and it was really a great experience to discuss, discuss about this great API uh, with the group. And also, uh, it's really great to be here uh, while providing these APIs to enable PWA. And it's, it has been uh, one of the essential API to uh, well, bring this happen. And, uh, well, not only the specs out of it, Samsung also committed to Chromium project. So we implemented and shipped quite a lot of uh, features. Our contribution to Chromium is not really uh, limited to service workers and the specs, but uh, here's uh, the list of features that we uh, shipped. And also, I... Uh, well, made a pull request to this uh, is service worker ready repository, uh, but really had to do this earlier because we uh, were there since this March. But just in time, uh, it has been merged, and it's really uh, happy to see our browser uh, as a well browser supporting service worker uh, in this list. And here is uh, the service worker feature status uh, release note for our uh, 4.0 release. So basically, we provide uh, the features based on Chromium 44 with some additions and changes. So please check uh, this out in developer.samsung.com uh, website. And here's uh, a demo. We have seen a lot, but I just want to show you how it works in uh, Samsung Internet on the Galaxy phone. Yes, this, uh, this is offline wiki. I uh, try to search Gangnam Style there. And uh, the caching is just triggered uh, on the page by user interaction. So this is one uh, usage of service worker. And then uh, it is shown up in the list of articles, cache it. And try to make sure this is working offline with the reliabil reliability bits. And opens up again, and uh, it is just working there. And yes, and uh, this is a first class citizen to uh, the native OS, so it's shown up in uh, the test manager. Yes, yeah, so this has been possible uh, well, due to a number of technologies, including service workers. So now let me just get um, down to more details about uh, service workers, some key concepts. So uh, let's wrap up. So basically, service worker is an event-based worker. So whenever uh, functional events is triggered inside of browser internals, then browser uh, spins off service worker. So supposing uh, there is a resource request from the page, then browser starts up, uh, spins up this service worker. And then uh, in this on-fetch event handler, 
uh, you as a developer uh, have a chance to just look up local cache. And if there's a uh, matched response, then it can be responded with the um, client right away. And when uh, the event handling is just done, then browser automatically terminates uh, the service worker. So just let's compare the lifetime of uh, a service worker to some other workers, like dedicated worker, for example. Uh, Dedicated worker is just created by uh, calling this constructor. Then uh, browser uh, creates a new thread, independent thread, to run this script. And the, the lifetime of this script is just bound to uh, its parent client. So unless it calls uh, the terminate, terminate API, then uh, it is just uh, will leave up to when the, the page is closed. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the service worker's lifetime is intentionally designed to be uh, very short. So as you have seen from uh, the, the figure in the previous page, service worker is just spinning off by uh, some browser events. So let's say fetch event has occurred, then it uh, creates an independent thread for service worker, and service worker uh, is running and dispatching some functional event there. And then uh, when uh, the event handling is done, then service worker, uh, I mean, the browser internal, internals terminate the service worker. And the same thing happens with uh, like a push API. Uh, actually, uh, browsers do all the smart things, like uh, just keeping service worker alive uh, until a uh, sequence of events are ha being handled. But uh, the basic concept of service worker lifetime is uh, like this. And let me just talk a little bit about uh, the spec itself. So here's a snippet of uh, some spec text. And I wanted to uh, talk about service worker registration and service worker concept. So this is uh, some internal, uh, internal concept, internal slots of, uh, well, those objects. And service worker registration is a state that uh, holds some multiple uh, different versions of service workers. And it is kit by scope URL. So there's installing worker associated with it, and waiting worker, and active worker. So when a service worker is being uh, a active worker after, after the successful installation, then it, it starts to control uh, the clients and dispatching a browser dispatch all those uh, events to this active worker. Uh, and uh, at the same time, a new service worker version can be uh, installed in the background. And when the installation is successfully done without any error, then uh, it's going to be an waiting wor a, a waiting worker, but it doesn't really uh, take the place of active worker right away. Uh, rather than that, it just waits until all the clients that uh, that are controlled by uh, the previous active worker, the incumbent active worker, are being closed. Then uh, the waiting worker will uh, be the new active worker. And uh, well, the service worker itself is uh, running on the registering client's origin, basically. So there are those concepts implemented by browser inside. And this is the whole picture of uh, all those implementations. So the upper part of this uh, figure is a script surface that you, as a uh, web developer, uh, access to. Like there are uh, like service worker regis registration JavaScript object and uh, all the uh, getters to get the um, active worker, installing worker, those things. Uh, but, well, there are underlying browser internal implementations there, uh, which implemented those internal concepts that I uh, described, I mean, explained in the previous slide. So it all uh, matches to uh, those states. And uh, whenever some uh, events is uh, triggered within browser, 
then the actual uh, threads, I mean, independent thread is working, and then uh, the event is being dispatched. And those threads are uh, kind of, uh, those threads can be accessed by the script service. So this is like a, a big picture of the whole stack. And also, let's uh, wrap up how to use uh, service worker uh, well, in a sequence. Like, in order to exploit this, uh, we surely have to register service worker. Uh, the installation is triggered by this registration, register API. And then on install is uh, getting dispatched by browser during this installation. And it is really a good place to uh, well, pre-cache all the static resource. And uh, when it uh, becomes acti an active worker, then uh, you can handle the functional events. And on activate is also an, a, a lifecycle event that is dispatched uh, well, during the installation. And this is a place where uh, you can just delete uh, whatever cache objects that, that will not be uh, used in the next version. And uh, we also provide uh, the update API, so you can explicitly uh, call this. And also, browser uh, well, triggers automatic update by every navigation and some uh, functional events like push event. So here's uh, the sequence of registration uh, operations, like from number one, number two, and number three. There are three register calls uh, in a sequence. So with the first one, we uh, create uh, our service worker registra registration in the map. Uh, with a scope being like slash bar. The second, second one has different scope, so it uh, creates another uh, new registration. But third one has uh, the same scope with the first one. So in this case, this service worker 2.js will take, it, take over the first one. And here's the installation process. I just wanted to uh, well, uh, explain how the state of those uh, service workers in the registration uh, changes. So uh, when the install process or update process is triggered, then uh, the first thing browser does is uh, fetch this service worker script from the network and evaluate this uh, script. So uh, assuming there are three uh, handlers, like uninstall, activate, and uh, fetch defined by developer, but uh, at this moment, uh, the fetch event is not really being dispatched because this uh, service worker is not really an active worker yet. So it's in installing state. And then uh, browser fires install. Then uh, you can do those pre-cache in this install handler. And all these things, when all these things are successfully done without, without any error, then it's uh, becoming an uh, a waiting worker, which is in installed state. But still, uh, this service worker is not really controlling any clients until uh, those clients controlled by uh, the incumbent service worker are closed. And when that happens, then browser dispatch this unactivated uh, event. And from this moment, uh, this service worker as being an active worker, a new worker, and then uh, all the functional events are getting fired. And here, here's also uh, an important, important concept to uh, wrap up. Like, there are some main resource uh, request and sub resource request. Main resource request is the client, I mean, uh, the page navigation or worker client creation. So, Service worker does the score match with this uh, main resource re request. So if there, uh, there's example.com slash index request, then we uh, try to do the score match here. So there's a uh, service worker registration matched to this specific scope. And uh, the service worker spins off. And we all do, all do this stuff. Then this. Uh, resource that returned by a uh, service worker as being uh, the main resource for this page. And once this service worker is as associated with this page, 
then uh, the page just leaves with uh, the service worker for its entire life. So uh, if there's uh, a sub-resource request to fetch an image uh, while well, residing in slash image slash flower the PNG, and uh, even though there is a registration that has a more specific scope uh, with this resource, it just spins off a uh, service worker with uh, whatever it is already associated. So it just uses sw.js, uh, not the image slash sw.js. OK, so uh, here are some patterns of APIs uh, that we can uh, look at. Like uh, this install handler uh, pro provides uh, the place where you can pre-cache all the static resource. So wait until it's the, um, an, an event to extend the lifetime of this event. And then you open up the cache and add all the stuff uh, in, the, in the cache object. And this is another use case like uh, cache on user demand. So this is the, the case, uh, what, you've, what you have seen uh, in the offline wiki demo. So uh, it just starts from the user inter interaction. When the user clicks on uh, well, some part of the element, then uh, we do some prevent, prevent default uh, the click event, and then open up the cache, and fetch uh, the dynamic contents, and then uh, well, just add those contents, I mean, those resources to cache. So it's just uh, start from the page, not even uh, started from service worker. And this one is more uh, general offline for use case, uh, what we have seen quite a lot. Like uh, on fetch event, uh, you can respond with uh, some resource that is passed in this API. And what we do is like uh, open cache object and then try to match the local cache first. And then if there's a response, then we just respond with that, with that result. Otherwise, we uh, go to the network and uh, well, update the cache and also uh, respond to the client at the same time. Uh, and this is uh, where you manage your cache versions, like on Activate. Uh, also, this is an ex extendable event, so you, uh, you just extend the event and get all the uh, cache objects there and just filter whatever you uh, will not really uh, require for your next version of the service, service worker, then uh, you will just explicitly delete all those objects. And this is uh, a push API example. So uh, with this one, uh, also a fu this functional event is an extendable event. So uh, call wait until, and then uh, open up cache, then fetch uh, whatever data uh, for well, this mailbox. Then uh, this example just uh, will do show notification with the first occurrence of this email list. And when user clicks on uh, this notification, then uh, you can do this like open window uh, operation. So here's uh, the obligatory, uh, well, Jake Archibald picture. And you can uh, check out all those use cases in uh, Offline Wiki. This is a great site. This is really uh, obligatory uh, material uh, in different sense. So uh, what comes next to PWA? So we are now here. And then, uh, well, we kind of hear quite a contentious discussion around the user experience about how a uh, user perceive uh, PWA in a browser. So we are uh, experimenting uh, how to just enhance the user experience to, uh, to this installation or keep uh, better. The keep is the verb that uh, Alex mentioned like uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, and I really uh, like this verb, keep, because the user just starts from uh, his tab, his own, uh, her own tab and then uh, keep this app, uh, and then it's just getting a, a more, uh, more capable applications. So that'll be kind of an interesting discussion to uh, just come with. 
And also, uh, on the spec side, we are not stopping here. So we are trying to just finish uh, the version one of service workers around uh, the third quarter of this year. And at the same time, we are discussing about some uh, new features uh, for free two, like foreign fetch and cache API enhancement, uh, those things. So, uh, well, I really uh, want to want us to think about uh, all this stuff and uh, really want to make the web dominate in uh, mobile as well as in uh, desk desktop world. So, well, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll hand back to Dan. Um, I've got now something that, uh, uh, now that you've had this kind of like deep dive into Service Worker and how Service Worker works, um, I thought it would be good to kind of like rise up for a second and, uh, and have a bit of philosophy, right? And the kind of philosophy that I'm talking about is web philosophy. Um, so I, I, by the way, if you haven't seen Existential Comics, I really recommend them. Go to Existential Comics and, and check it out. Um, very, very good stuff. Um, so uh, the part of web philosophy that I want to talk about is thematic consistency. Um, I was uh, involved in 2005 uh, in creating something called the Mobile Web Initiative. The Mobile Web Initiative and the Mobile Web Best Practices that were produced from the working group that I chaired, um, which was the Mobile Web Best Practices group, uh, were really from a different era of the mobile web. It was from an era where uh, most phones did not have uh, and could not have very capable browsers on them. Um, they had uh, compact HTML browsers. They had uh, very, very cut down browsers. Um, and we needed some rules uh, to give to uh, content providers to uh, give them uh, kind of um, best practices for how to build content in that environment, right? So many of those best practices actually don't hold true, to, true today. Um, and I would argue probably aren't needed. Uh, we don't need that kind of thing today. However, there is one rule, which was our number one rule, that, uh, or number one best practice that I think holds true today as much as it did in 2008. And that is uh, the uh, idea of thematic consistency. Uh, so, so to quote the best practice, um, is to ensure that content provided by accessing a URI yields a thematically coherent experience when accessed from, a different, from different devices. Um, and this is something that we called the one web principle. Um, so one web is a bit of a philosophical concept, right? Uh, it is not necessarily a technical concept, but it is something that arguably knits the web together. Um, and it's based on the idea of the URL. Uh, being the key technological or architectural element um, within the web. And I think this relates to something that I've been hearing about. I've been hearing a lot of questions from web developers who have asked, well, now that you're talking about progressive, uh, pro um, uh, pro progressive web apps and moving everything towards progressive web apps and offline first and all that kind of stuff, do we throw everything that we knew already about responsive web design out the window? Is this totally a new thing? And I would argue, and I think that we, ha we have to make this the case, that progressive web apps must be built on responsive web design principles. So this is, a, this is something that's additive on top of something that we already know, which is how to build great responsive um, web applications, which is the current uh, kind of best practice around how to satisfy the thematic consistency best practice. Um, and it's all about, in my view, respecting the URL. So it's about when you go to a certain URL, you know that you're going to get the same content. You're, you know you're going to get something similar, something thematically consistent, no matter what device uh, you go from, be it a phone, be it a PC, be it a, a, a tablet, be it a television, a uh, refrigerator, uh, whatever you've got in front of you, you're going to get something that is consistent. And philosophy. OK, I've only got one more thing to talk about, and then I'm going to and then. I'm, I'm, you're, you're not going to see me again. Well, you are going to see me for the panel. Um, and that is web and VR. And that's something that, is, that Samsung is particularly interested in because we have this thing called the Gear VR headset, 
um, which is basically like uh, you take your Samsung phone, you plug it into the front. Um, it's a bit more uh, complex than Google, Google Cardboard, um, sorry, uh, because it also involves uh, their extra sensors. There's a bit of a touchpad, um, but basically it's the same kind of same kind of concept, um, and it's a part, It's in partnership with Oculus. Uh, so uh, so. What we've done, or what uh, is to produce a browser, uh, which is actually a separate browser that sits within the Oculus environment um, within uh, within the uh, Gear VR, um, and that is uh, based on the same core. It's also Service Worker uh, enabled, um, and. A lot of the focus here is on providing a viewing experience for immersive content, for 360-degree content, um, that kind of thing. Um, so we've enabled uh, by uh, using specific video metadata uh, for these uh, for 3D content, for immersive content, to be able to just come right up into the uh, browser that's sitting uh, within the within the VR uh, environment, um, and. We're doing this because uh, we want to enable this kind of experience where you could, which I'm calling like a mixed browsing experience or a continuous experience, um, where you can be using your phone uh, to do kind of regular browsing. You're reading a news article, for instance. Um, you see that a news that at the bottom of this news article, there's a uh, oh, there's a 360-degree video associated with this, or there's an immersive experience associated with this. So. Being able to go straight from there, plugging the phone into the goggles, and actually experiencing that immersive experience, that's something that we want to enable. Um, and that's, uh, that's built using this, uh, this extra browser, um, or this separate browser. But uh, what we've enabled is this kind of a, a experience where you can go straight from one to, into the other, and it, and it uh, goes straight to what you were looking at before. Um, so. I won't go into too much more detail on that because uh, we're out of time. But uh, in fact, I'm going to blow through this as well. Um, the, uh, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about is that we are working on a web VR specification with Google, with Mozilla. Um, and that is uh, enabling extra APIs, uh, sensor APIs, and the, and the ability to, to know whether or not your phone is hooked into such VR goggles. Um, and all of that is being worked on. Um, in a W3C community group, uh, which we helped to form. And hopefully, we are going to be uh, seeing a workshop coming up later this year, W3C workshop on web and VR. Um, so watch the space for that. So anyway, thanks very much for listening. And I'm going to hand back over to Paul. <laughs>